beautiful ladies and handsome men. I am not sure what's true or false in this story. I take gossip, tea, rumor, and scandal from yesteryear, from online, from word of mouth, from books, and I ball it up and I tell you guys a story. Now, let's get to it. Hi, everybody. This is Ashley with Ashley Says So, and I am back with another Old Hollywood Scandals video. This story tried to get lost to the pages of history, but we are not going to let it. It is a very tragic tale of singer Jesse Belvin, who everybody thought was destined for greatness. But instead, all he was able to find was true, pure love before tragedy struck and cut both of their lives short. Let's get to it. Jesse Lorenzo Belvins was born on December the 15th, 1932 in San Antonio, Texas. His mother's name was Selena Allen Belvins and his father's name was Jack Belvins. And I'm not sure if Selena or Jack had any more children outside of Jesse, but I honestly don't think they did. Because from what I saw, it looks like Jesse and his mother Selena were alone most of the time while he was growing up. Because his father Jack ended up passing away when Jesse was only about four years old. And when his father Jack did pass away, Selena scooped up her son Jesse and they moved from San Antonio, Texas to Los Angeles, California. And it was in Los Angeles, California where Jesse's mother Selena found out that her son had a beautiful voice. And so Selena immediately told her son that he would be using his gift for the Lord. So she made Jesse go to church and become a part of the choir. And this is something that he was very good at. In fact, he really enjoyed it. By the time he became a preteen, probably around 11 or 12 years old, he even became the choir leader. I think it was of the youth choir, but still he became a choir leader. It seemed like Jesse was going to go the way of James Cleveland or Sam Cooke or Lou Ross and all of the rest of these singers who ended up growing up in church and then ended up having a singing career in the church, even if it was only for a little while. But Jesse didn't follow these footsteps at all. By the time he was a real teenager, you know, 14, 15, 16 years old, he didn't want to be looked at like some lame goody two-shoes. So he started to spend less time in the holy choir and more time in the ratchet street. And this change came easy to him, honey, because you see, Jesse was known as hot stuff. He still had his country south look and he was tall and lanky but he was also kind of buff. And the thing that the girls loved most of all was that Jesse was bowlegged. He come walking outside with his wife beater on, his tight jeans and his Hirachi sandals, had his little bandana stuffed in his back pocket and honey they just thought he was it. And speaking of all the girls who wanted to get with him, Etta James who lived right down the street from him was the the main one, baby. Honey, Etta James had no shame in telling the story herself. How she would just kind of throw her stuff out there hoping that Jesse Belvins would uh, take the hook, but he never did. I don't think he was really attracted to Etta James, but you know, he was cool with her. And his personality was also everything. He fit in with everybody. The boy even knew Spanish. And so with the Latino people who were living in Los Angeles in his hood at the time, you know, Jesse could walk over there and be cool with them. He was just one of those guys who everybody loved. If the girls want to be with him, the boys want to be him. And something that makes him even more loved is that even though he stopped going to church does not mean that he stopped singing. He was still singing and let's sprinkle a little bit more greatness on him. Not only could he sing, the boy could write. So throughout the day, every day, he was writing dozens of songs. And some of these songs were really good songs. So much so that fake wannabe record producers who actually just worked at record stores would talk Jesse into selling his songs to them. So it became a hustle for Jesse. He would write all of these songs with ease and then he would go inside of the record store where the fake producer worked and then the fake record producer would be like, you know, that one, that one right there, I want that song. And he would end up paying Jesse like $100 for the song. Well, Jesse thought he was making some money, but of course we know better than that because we know that fake record producer would go to a real record producer and sell the song for so much more. So Jesse Belvins, a lot of times, thought that he was doing something by selling his songs when really he was missing out on thousands of dollars. 
Eventually, other doors started opening for Jesse. In 1949, when he was around 17 years old, he ended up performing with Lionel Hampton at the uh, Cavalcade of Jazz Festival. And then in 1950, he became a part of a quartet that was actually the backing band for saxophonist Big J McNeely. And even though Jesse Belvins was singing with three other people, he still managed to stand out because of his singing talent. So in 1952, he signed with one of his first record labels and that was called Specialty Records. He finally started to make a little noise when he came out with the song Dream Girl. Dream Girl was the biggest song that Jesse had ever recorded and it even went all the way up to number two on the Billboard R&B chart. But in 1953, Jesse had to put his singing career on hold because he got drafted into the military into the Korean War. It didn't matter how many bullets, machetes, and whatever else may have been flying all across Jesse's slick back here while he was at war, uh, it was still not enough to dim his creative talent. And so while he was off at war, he wrote the biggest song of his songwriting career. And that song was called Earth Angel. And yes, I'm talking about Earth Angel, the song that Otis was singing when he was walking behind Josephine. I hope and I pray that someday I'll be the vision. Don't act like y'all done forgot. Thinking he was sounding all good, then was looking stupid because Johnny May was standing to the side listening in and then later on took the Temptations money. But to get back to this story, Jesse Belvins wrote that song. He ended up selling it to a producer and the producer gave it to a group called the Penguins and it was up from there. The song became a staple in doo-wop. It was a million record seller, basically a game changer. And no, Jesse Belvins did not get much money from all of this, but it absolutely boosted his career. And Jesse was excited to get home to build on this boosted career. But more than that, he was excited to get home for the reason of this boosted career. The motivation behind his song, Dream Girl and the motivation most likely behind this newest song, Earth Angel. Joanne Johnson was a beautiful 17-year-old chocolate Nefertiti. She was rumored to have worked in a record store where she and Jesse first met. As a matter of fact, I think she worked in the record store where Jesse used to come in and sell his music. Well, from the first moment that Jesse saw Joanne, her good looks had him in a chokehold. And yes, she was beautiful when she was all dolled up, but baby, even in her natural state, she was a goddess. Her skin was smooth, dark and melanated. Her hair was long and thick and some rumors even say that it went down almost to her behind. And yes, she was the type to wear wigs to try to keep up with the fashions of the day. But baby, believe me, once she took those wigs off, it was nothing but pure, beautiful hair up under there. She also had these cat-shaped eyes that glowed whenever she looked at Jesse. She was absolutely something else, but her looks were just the tip of the iceberg. Jesse Belvin was Jesse Belvin. Belvins. He had had girls with great looks going crazy over him since he was around 14 years old. So even though Joanne was beautiful, and that is what caught Jesse's attention, of course, that is not what made him commit for the long haul. Joanne was loyal to a fault, and the girl was smart. As soon as she and Jesse Belvin started dating, Joanne started to upgrade him like she was Beyonce or somebody. Remember I told you that Jesse would sell his songs to those fake wannabe producers? Joanne stopped all that. She, with her beauty and her charisma, was able to introduce Jesse directly to the real producer, cutting out the middleman completely. So of course, this meant that Jesse was now making way more than just $100 per song. Joanne was also very good with contracts and negotiating, and she read over everything that Jesse signed with a fine tooth comb. She made sure that Jesse wasn't signing anything unless it was the best for him, unless it was top of the line deal. This girl was 17 years old and had the business acumen of a 35 year old Barry Gordy. Jesse and Joanne were probably together only about six months before he made her his manager. That's how much he trusted her judgment. That's how much he trusted her. He loved her so much. 
He felt like she brought so much to the table for him and he absolutely admired her and worshiped the ground that she walked on. And their love was palpable to everybody around. You know, most women hated to see Joanne coming because there was no question that when Jesse looked at her, this is the woman that he was going to choose. This is who he wanted. And they were right. When Jesse found Joanne, he felt like he found his wife and he made her his wife in the year 1953. With Joanne by his side guiding him, Jesse went full force into his career. In 1956, he came out with his biggest hit to date, and that song was called Good Night My Love. It played everywhere. It got so much airtime. It was catchy. Everybody knew the song. As a matter of fact, the song was so popular that Alan Free took the song and made it his theme music for the outro of his radio show. So every single night that Alan Free's radio show came on, that song, Good Night My Love, played at the end of the show. I mean, you couldn't buy better publicity for a song. As Jesse continued to write as well as sing songs that made it on the charts, he started to be pegged as the next big thing. White people in the know pegged him to be the next Elvis or maybe even the next Frank Sinatra. Black people in the know thought he was going to be the next Nat King Cole. As a matter of fact, some people thought he was going to be bigger than Nat King Cole. And out of all of the young black male upcoming singers, um, Sam Cooke, Lou Rawls, Ray Charles, etc., Jesse Belvin was the man to beat. All of the smaller record labels started bidding and betting on him. Each one of them wanted him to be signed with them. They just knew Jesse Belvins was about to be that next superstar. They felt it down in their bones. And Jesse Belvins himself felt the same way. He knew he was so close. He just felt like he needed one more song to kind of tip him over the edge. And just like she had many times before, his baby Joanne came through for him. First off, Joanne started to work with Jesse to develop his style. She told him that he needed to come up with a signature style and a signature singing style. Instead of singing every type and style of song that he could think of, why didn't he give himself a signature sound? Was he gonna be a Nat King Cole type of singer, a Elvis type of singer, a Big Joe Turner type of singer? And so Jesse started to work on himself. And from the looks of it, he chose to be styled behind a Nat King Cole. Or better yet, no, he actually became Sam Cooke before Sam Cooke was Sam Cooke. He turns from a cute and sexy singer to a sophisticated, high-class, brassy-voiced singer. His style is very suave, very debonair. So now that Joanne has styled her husband to be in the upper echelon on a higher level, she feels like, you know, he don't need to be working with none of these little stinking uh, little old labels. He needs something high-class. So while all of those small labels are fighting each other and all of them are handing Jesse a contract begging him to sign, Joanne puts on her good wig puts her sexy smart dress on. Then she puts her business pumps on her stockinged legs and takes her huge brain and business savvy tail over to RCA. Baby, by the end of the meeting, RCA is slobbering at the chance to sign Jesse Belvin. Offered him a contract where he would make five albums with them. But that ain't nothing, honey. Joanne had talked her husband up so much that allegedly RCA offered them an additional clause on the contract where Jesse would also make five movies with them. Joanne Belvin's was a boss and her husband loved her for it. So Joanne has developed her husband to find his signature style. She's got him a great contract where he signed with RCA. And there was one more thing that she did to help him tip the scales to stardom. And that is when she sat down one day in her home and started thinking about just how much she loved her husband, Jesse. She picked up a pen and a paper and she started to write a love letter to him. But by this time, which was the year 1959, Jesse and Joanne had two sons. And child, I'm guessing them kids was acting bad and getting on her nerves or something because uh, Joanne ended up not finishing the letter. Still though, Jesse ended up finding the unfinished letter and it touched his heart so much that he decided to surprise her by turning her words into a song. When he came into the room, seeing 
didn't get to Joanne, of course she loved it. But who loved it even more than Joanne was RCA. They titled the song Guess Who and they put it out to the public. Guess Who was a top 40 hit and it also was all over the airway. And although Jesse had written songs that had charted before this one, even some that had charted higher than this one, this time he had an actual machine behind him. He was no longer signed to one of those little Rudy Poo labels. Now he had a big label, RCA, behind him. So RCA was able to take this song, Guess Who, that had made it on the charts and use it to explode Jesse into the market. Suddenly, Jesse Belvin started appearing in all type of uh, newspaper articles. They got him on TV with one of his appearances being on American Bandstand. RCA had even crafted Jesse Belvin's a personal stage name. And honey, you know when you got a personal stage name, you made it. Jackie Wilson's stage name was Mr. Excitement. James Brown, the hardest working man in show business. But see, Jesse wasn't no dancing, jumping howler like uh, Jackie Wilson then. Jesse was smooth with his singing and with his Mood. He didn't excite the women and whip them up into some type of frenzy. He got to their senses by relaxing them with his passion had a slight drawl to his singing. Still had those magnificent country boy looks. You know, he had that smile with the lip that kind of dipped to the side a little bit. RCA had the perfect name for him and they called him Mr. Easy. And it wasn't long before Mr. Easy was coming to a stage near you because RCA was putting the finishing touches on making him a star and that was to send him off on tour. With all of these wonderful changes in Jesse Belvin's career, success started to come to him quickly. And sometimes things would kind of pop up to challenge the relationship he had with his wife, Joanne. I know one of the things that they were having problems with is because Joanne did not play about Jesse at all. I mean, look, she understood that folks were gonna shout and scream at her man, but she did not understand a little bit nobody reaching out to touch her husband. And the problem was, is that a lot of the time when Jesse Belvin toured, he toured with Jackie Wilson. And Jackie Wilson was notorious for letting women touch him on stage. I detailed that a whole lot in his actual video. Jackie Wilson would have them women come up on stage, hunch him, baby, they would touch all over his privates and everything. He would even allow them to tongue kiss him. And so Jackie's reputation preceded him. And wherever he went, women could not wait to come to his show. So again, Jackie Wilson encouraged this behavior. And because Jesse Belvin was on tour with him, a lot of the women just assumed that they would be able to be this way with Jesse Belvin as well. Well, they would get the shock of their life when they would try and Jesse would immediately, you know, push them off. But baby, that little pushing them off didn't matter to some of them women. Now baby, they had paid their good hard earned money and they expected to touch some good low hanging Johnson. And you sitting up there pushing them out the way, baby, they'll sit up there and push Jesse's hand right back out of the way and still continue to try to touch on him. And this is when Joanne would step in. <laughs> Etta James told a story one time of how Joanne came to the first row and fought every woman sitting there. Baby, that first row of women kept on touching and palming at Jesse after he told him to stop. Each one of them got some sense knocked into him and she won too. Baby, she was laying them out, tagging them. So women on the road and jealousy kind of became a problem. And also Jesse's very friendly demeanor and his feeling like it was his responsibility to help everybody get out of the hood also kind of uh, messed with their relationship. And it wasn't that Joanne didn't want to help people around them, but she kind of felt like, you know, dang, Jesse, let's stack our money first and get us out of the hood. You know, let's do for us and our children, and then we'll help other people. But Jesse was not having any of that. Etta James, once again, she told a story of how Jesse Belvins had been off on tour, and then one Christmas, he came back to his old stumping ground, the neighborhood he used to live in when he lived down the street from Etta. So anyway, he comes knocking on Etta's door and then he comes in and he's like, hey, James Etta, how you doing? You know, and she's like, oh my God, Jesse Belvins, how are you? You know, I haven't seen you in forever. And
And so he comes on into the house and he notices like they don't have any heat. He also notices that they have no food in the refrigerator. And what really bothered him most of all was the fact that it was Christmas and Etta and her mother couldn't even afford a Christmas tree. So Jesse told Etta that she and her mother were welcome to come by his apartment later on and he would have something for them. So Etta James and her mother did show up at Jesse's apartment. And when they got there, Jesse started to break open a piggy bank and that is when Joanne walked up and she snatches the piggy bank away from him. And she tells him, you know, no, Jesse, you know, I'm sorry, but we can't keep giving our money away. You know, we got to save our own money. You cannot give our savings away. And Jesse tells Joanne, I gotta help James Etta and her mother. You know, they need our help. And Joanne is like, you know, no, Jesse, you keep giving our money away, no. And then things got real serious real fast. Because baby Etta said Jesse looked to the side all serious like and was like, woman, you don't tell me what I can and cannot do. I say Joanne handed the piggy bank over and cut out. And then there are also rumors that Jesse Belvin started to drink a little bit. So that kind of affected their relationship. But regardless of all of these problems, whether big or small, nothing could dim the burning passion and love between Jesse and Joanne. And not only were they still deeply in love with each other, everybody else loved them. Even though Etta James started started out wanting Jesse for herself and not liking Joanne. Now she also was one of their cheerleaders. So people supported them. They were the young couple that was going to change the world. And then on February the 5th, 1960, Jesse and his wife Joanne traveled to Little Rock, Arkansas. So Jesse Belvin could appear in a show with Jackie Wilson, Sam Cooke, and Marv Johnson. And this concert was a big deal, not only because of all of this grand talent, it was also a huge deal because this was going to be the first first integrated concert in Little Rock, Arkansas's history. So Jesse Belvin, as well as Sam Cooke, Jackie Wilson, all of them were honored to be able to make history this night, but they were also sort of nervous. And unfortunately, they were right to be nervous. When the show got started, some of the whites in the audience were very upset that they had to watch this show next to black people. And so the super racist ones started screaming insults to the black people. And of course, this was a very stupid thing to do because how are you screaming nasty racial insults to the black side of the audience, wanting them to leave so you can watch a show that feature black people in peace? What? Then not only was that a stupid way to think, why do you think that the black talent in front of you is still going to want to perform for you after you uh, hurl racist insults to their people, the black people? I mean, just stupidity, just slow and stupid. And that's what Jesse and the rest of the entertainers thought as well. So the show was canceled. Well, those racist whites with the stupid logic became even more stupid because they felt like, how dare they cancel the show? You know, who do those Negroes think they are? And they whipped themselves up into a frenzy. Like it basically became a riot. And the racist white people in the audience ran outside and started to surround the cars of Sam Cooke, uh, Jackie Wilson, Jesse Belvin, Marv Johnson. Finally, it took some cops who had been there the whole time but hadn't done anything. I think finally it took those cops to finally uh, shoo the racist children away. And when they did, everybody jumped in their car. Now, Jackie Wilson and Jesse Belvin had already made plans to leave together and trail each other because earlier during the show backstage, Jesse Belvin started to tell Jackie Wilson just how much he loved Jackie's car. Jackie had a 1959 light blue Cadillac or something like that, and Jesse saw it outside, and Jesse was like, you know, woo wee, man, that's a bad car. And Jackie, who was the most successful and most wealthy singer on the bill, basically told uh, Jesse, you know, man, you love it that much. I tell you what, dude, when we leave here, get in your car and trail behind me, follow me to my house, and then when you get there, you can take it. 
you can have the Cadillac. I'll just go buy me a new one. And so now that they were leaving the venue, that is what they were doing. So you had Jackie Wilson and his chauffeur in the first car turning this way, followed by Jesse Belvin's car. And then Jesse Belvin's car, there was the chauffeur, Charles, who was driving. There was Jesse Belvin sitting in the middle and Joanne was sitting shotgun on the passenger side in the front seat. So all three of them were in the front. The driver, Charles, Jesse, and Joanne. And again, they are trailing behind Jackie Wilson and his chauffeur. There is a third car that is behind both of them as well. And this is a car that is full of musicians. Now listen closely because this next part of the story has two different versions. So listen closely. Now I told you that Jesse Belvins has a chauffeur that's driving him by the name of Charles. This guy Charles used to be Ray Charles's chauffeur, but Ray Charles ended up firing him as his driver because every time Ray Charles did a show, somebody would come up to Ray Charles and be like, hey man, you know, ain't your driver supposed to be in the hotel sleep? Man, this man out here sitting in the crowd, he tapping his feet along with you. He drinking drinks, dancing with the girls. You know, I thought your driver was supposed to be getting some sleep. So the driver Charles, again, instead of in the hotel sleep, he would be at the show listening to Ray Charles dancing and stuff. I guess he felt like since Ray Charles was blind, he wasn't gonna see him out there or something. And so because he wouldn't get any sleep when it was time to leave and get on the road, Ray Charles himself wouldn't be able to get any sleep because he had to stay awake while his chauffeur Charles was driving because Charles had a habit of falling asleep on the road. Well, Ray Charles got tired of not being able to get his rest while he was driving to the next venue. So he ended up firing uh, Charles the driver. Well, Charles the driver came to Jesse Belvin, who I've already told you has a huge heart. And Charles starts telling him, you know, I need a job, man, what I'ma do? And so Jesse tells him, hey man, okay, I tell you what, you can be my driver. Well, on this night, this guy Charles is driving uh, Jesse and Joanne, once again, following behind Jackie Wilson, and then the car of musicians who is behind Jesse, Joanne, and Charles, they start to notice that Jesse's car starts to veer all across the road. And so they start honking their horn and flashing their lights because it's clear to them that Charles the chauffeur has fallen asleep and most likely Jesse and Joanne are also asleep because nobody is correcting the car. So they're blowing the horn, flashing the lights, and Charles does wake up. You know, he wakes up and he starts driving back straight, but then sooner or later, the musicians behind them start to see Jesse's car swerving all across the road again. So this time the musicians, not only do they uh, honk their horns and flash their lights, uh, when Charles straightens back up, they drive up beside him, tell him to roll the window down and they ask him, hey Charles man, do you wanna pull over with us? You know, we're about to pull over and get some fresh air. We really think you need to too because you need to wake up. And so Charles says, yes. He pulls over with the musicians for fresh air. Well, while Charles is getting out, stretching his legs, uh, getting fresh air, Jesse and Joanne are still in the front seat and they are still asleep. And allegedly, the musician later on attested to this, that they saw Jesse and Joanne in the front seat sleep and uh, Charles was out walking and talking with them. Well, probably after about 20 to 25 minutes, Charles, Jesse's driver, tells the car of musicians, hey guys, you know, I'm gonna go ahead and get back on the road. You know, I'm actually supposed to be right behind Mr. Jackie Wilson. So I don't wanna be pulled over on the side of the road too long where I can't keep up and end up getting lost trying to go to his house. So the group of musicians ask Charles, they're like, are you sure, man? You know, have you woken up? And Charles is like, hey man, I'm good. I'm woke now. Plus I gotta do it because I gotta get Jesse to Jackie Wilson's house. So this story says the musicians watch as Charles gets back into the driver's seat of Jesse's car and he drives off. Probably about 10 minutes after this, the musicians get back into their car and they start to drive. Gossip claims that about 15 minutes into them driving down the road, they hear a large boom. It almost sounds like a sonic boom. And at the same time they hear this boom, the sky in front of them, which is dark, lights up. The musicians start wondering what the heck was that and what the heck just happened. And so they continue driving and they pull up to a horrific 
scene. Per this version of the story, Charles, the driver and chauffeur in Jesse Belvin's car, had fallen asleep once again. And when he did, he veered into the oncoming lane and he hit a car head on. Now that's the first version of how the Jesse Belvin car wreck happened which says it was the fault of Charles the chauffeur. The second version of the story of how that wreck happened paints a totally different picture. In fact, the second version of the story says back at the theater when all of those racist whites was around everybody's car, some of those were up under uh, Jesse Belvin's car. And allegedly, while they were up under his car, they made slits to his tires, basically rigging the tires to blow out later on down the road. And this version of the story says nothing at all about the car continuously veering off the road and straightening it back up or anything like that. It just basically says it veered off the road one time. And of course that was the final time because that is when it collided with the oncoming car. And this story right here is the version that a lot of people in the black community not only believed back then, but believe now. In fact, the black community back then was almost in an uproar because it was clear to them that Jesse Belvin and his beautiful wife, this beautiful couple, uh, were killed by racist people. And what made them believe this story even more is that allegedly, while Jesse was still at the venue, when those white racist people were acting crazy, allegedly he called his mother and he was talking to his mother telling her, you know, things are bad, mama. You know, I feel so uncomfortable. You know, they talking to us any kind of way. You know, mama, I just, I'm, I'm ready to leave here I'm scared and so this man calling his mama to say this and then he winds up dead yeah a lot of people believed that uh his car was basically rigged or manipulated and that's how he ended up wrecking I don't know which version is true we possibly will never know which version is true but whichever version is true it was an absolutely horrific scandalous traumatic thing that happened when those musicians pulled up on the wreck site they saw immediately that the people that were in the oncoming car the car that jesse them hit they saw immediately that those people were dead because allegedly their car was still on fire and in that car was famous deep sea diver max Jean noel and his wife which wow ain't it some irony in that Let's say it is true that the racists did do Jesse's tires like that. You ended up killing two of your own well-known good people, allegedly. Y'all killed two of them trying to kill the black folk. But to move on, the musicians probably would have rather seen Jesse's car uh, in flames instead of what they saw. Because as they walked around Jesse's car, the first thing they noticed was that Charles Ford, which was the uh, chauffeur's whole name, Charles Ford was dead at the wheel. And as they walked on to the front of the car, they got the shock of their life. Because from mid waist up, Jesse Belvin was through the windshield laid on the front of the car. They said his clothes were all ripped up, like ripped to shreds. As they moved in closer to try to see if they could see any signs of life, uh, they noticed that his face was mutilated. There were cuts and shards of glass everywhere and then his nose was actually ripped up like it was flapping from up here all of this was ripped up and as they started to kind of tap him or maybe shake him and say his name that is when they noticed the most gruesome wound of all and that was the fact that jesse belvin was a uh, halfway decapitated and when they saw that there was a mix of shock and fear and grief you know everything was eerie because here are these people in death. And then it was a lot of grief because Jesse Belvin, the guy that was about to do big things, the guy that everybody was banking on, the guy that was this close, he just had tipped things into his favor. He was gone. Just like that, his life was gone. 27 years old, gone. And the musicians were so caught up in these thoughts that it even took them a minute to even remember Joanne. Where was Joanne? They didn't see her in the car, so at first they assumed that Joanne had also gone through the windshield and that maybe she was laid off in a field somewhere or she was further down the road. But when they got around and opened the passenger door, 
they found something incredible. Joanne had not left the car at all. And from the way her body was positioned up under the radio and up under the dashboard, uh, it was some sort of miracle that this had happened. And that is when it dawned on them. It was no miracle at all. It was Jesse. They remembered when uh, they were pulled over on the side of the road and they saw Jesse in the middle sleep and he had his arm up under his wife's head. So she was right here with her head laid on his arm. She was also asleep. So it was clear that when their car had swerved into the oncoming lane, just before the impact, Jesse had woke up, saw what was about to happen and took his wife's head and pushed her under the dashboard, pushed her under the radio. This man had used the last moments of his life to ensure that his wife did not go through that windshield with him to ensure that he would push his wife down so she could survive that crash. And it was because of his quick thinking that Joanne did indeed survive the crash. When they opened the door and saw her balled up down there, Joanne let out a yelp. They couldn't believe it. She was alive. But she was in horrible shape. She had a crushed chest, a crushed pelvis, as well as a broken arm. And more unfortunate for her is that she was in Arkansas. So when she was taken to the hospital, they would not give her any care because they said they needed the hospital bill to be paid up Sadly, nobody around her, none of those musicians or anything had that type of money. So for hours, Joanne sat through the night just languishing in all of her pain with all of her injuries until Jackie Wilson made it home. See, remember, Jackie Wilson was in front of Jesse Belvin them. So Jackie Wilson didn't even have any idea that uh, Jesse Belvin them had been in a car wreck. So when he finally did get home, he was expecting Jesse, Joanne, and everybody else to pull up to his house you know no later than the next hour but instead when Jackie Wilson got home and walked into his house his phone was ringing off the hook and uh when he finally picked it up it was the musicians calling from the Arkansas hospital to tell Jackie Wilson what happened to tell him that Jesse Belvin had been in this horrible wreck and now he had passed away and his wife Joanne was here at this hospital but nobody was treating her because nobody had the money Jackie didn't miss a beat hung the phone right up told his chauffeur uh no don't go home yet we got to turn right back around and we got to go back to Arkansas got all this money together jumped in the car and headed right back down to Arkansas he got there to that hospital and he dropped a bag of cash letting them know that Joanne was to receive the best care out there unfortunately by that time Joanne was in a deep coma but her father was able to fly in from Los Angeles and sit with her and actually Miraculously, many times during the day on February the 6th, uh, Joanne would come out of the coma. Allegedly, she would open her eyes really wide and try to look around, and then she would take her hand and she would bang on the side of the hospital bed. That's all she could do. She couldn't talk. She couldn't move anything else. Just her eyes and banging on the side of the hospital bed. The nurses thought maybe she was hungry, you know, maybe she needed to be changed, but they uh, checked everything. Everything seemed okay, but she continued to bang and so her father would talk to her he would stroke her hair and no matter what Joanne would bang well while her father was there she woke up and banged the side of the bed maybe around three times before he finally caught on to what was happening. He understood that Joanne was looking for Jesse. She was trying to hear her husband's voice, trying to see her husband's face. And so the story says that the last time that she banged, her father basically said, you know, Joanne, you looking for Jesse? Baby, your husband, Jesse, he didn't make it. He didn't make it. Said as soon as he told her that, she stopped banging on the side of the bed, she closed her eyes, and she never opened them again. Joanne Belvin was only 23 years old when she left this earth. Jesse Belvin had tried with all of his might to save his wife even though he was facing certain death and his wife had decided that she didn't want the life if she had to go through it without the love of her husband, the love of her Jesse. And so 
Jesse and Joanne Belvin left this earth at the age of 27 and 23. Uh, whether it was because of a careless chauffeur driver or a bunch of races, you know, once again, we will never know. But this is the old Hollywood scandalous tale of Mr. Jesse Belvin. Um, I hope you guys liked this video. If you did, go ahead and hit the like button. Also, go ahead and subscribe. Quit sitting around just watching. Go ahead and click the button. Um, I love you guys so much. I will be back with another video soon. And for everybody who was watching the live when I said the next video was going to be about somebody who had a big afro in the 1970s, uh, that video is coming. As a matter of fact, I think that video is going to be next. I just had to kind of push it back. But anyways, I love you guys so much. I'll see you guys soon. Bye.